Hello and welcome to episode 12 of my Employment Law Snapshots. In this month's episode I'll be talking about Donald Trump, Brexit, the gig economy and tax payments. Hello and welcome to January 2017. It's been a pretty quiet start to the new year and completely lacking in controversy. There's only been the recent decision of the Supreme Court dismissing the government's argument that it's got the power to begin official Brexit negotiations with the rest of the EU without Parliament's prior agreement. And of course, Donald J. Trump became president last week following an entirely uncontroversial inauguration. It was fascinating to see the first two days of his presidency focusing on whether his crowd numbers were bigger than Obama's and the reliance on alternative facts to support his position. On that note, I'm delighted to announce that this video has already had over 1 million views. As far as alternative facts are concerned, this is simply tremendous. On with the law. This week's case is a follow-up to episode 11 and the Uber decision relating to workers in the gig economy. The case is called Dewhurst against City Sprint. In this case, the tribunal was again faced with the challenge of the gig economy and the often fine line between worker and self-employed status. The claimant, Miss Dewhurst, was a cycle courier working for City Sprint, based in central London. City Sprint asserted themselves to be one of the UK's largest and fastest growing same day courier businesses, operating a fleet of around 50 to 60 cycle couriers. Miss Dewhurst was part of the company's medical fleet, one of around 10 couriers, working four days per week. Miss Dewhurst argued in the tribunal that she was, in fact, a worker as opposed to being a self employed contractor, as alleged by the company. As such, she claimed that she was entitled to the basic employment rights that come with being classified as a worker, such as holiday pay, sick pay and the national living wage. Specifically, she was claiming for the company's failure to pay her for two days holiday. In the tribunal, City Sprint said that it recruits its couriers as independent contractors under a document entitled Confirmation Tender to Supply Courier Services to City Sprint UK Limited. Although the couriers weren't obliged to physically sign this document in the way that employment contracts usually are, they had to read and acknowledge its terms. The document stated that the recruits are self-employed and neither an employee nor a worker of City Sprint. Under this agreement, the courier agrees to undertake assigned jobs and comply with the job details. However, the agreement said that City Sprint had no obligation to offer work and that the courier wasn't under an obligation to accept work offered to them. Some of the details that came out during the case included the fact that couriers, like Miss Dewhurst, carried with them a City Tracker. This is an electronic tracking device that had to be switched on whenever the courier was available to accept jobs. This system tracks the courier's whereabouts and helps the controllers to assign and manage jobs. However, the agreement said that Miss Dewhurst had the right to send a substitute in her place for any particular job, provided that she notified City Sprint in advance. City Sprint argued that this was a clear indication of a contractor relationship because the courier didn't have to provide the services personally. However, the tribunal took the view that this clause was, in reality, inoperable and in practice Miss Dewhurst didn't have the right to send a substitute in her place. This was because her role required security clearances and specific training and equipment that would allow her to transport medical supplies, such as blood. It was therefore not easily transferable and she was in fact personally contracted to carry out the work. City Sprint also tried to rely on their self-billing payment process as evidence for their couriers being self-employed. However, as the couriers' payments were automatically calculated and were paid weekly in arrears, this wasn't enough to convince the tribunal that they were self-employed. The couriers didn't have to invoice for their own work, which is very different to the normal way that a self-employed contractor operates. On the evidence, the tribunal concluded that Miss Dewhurst was in fact a worker and not a self-employed contractor during the time that she was logged on to the city tracker. Once again, as with the Uber case, the tribunal were prepared to look behind what the agreement between the parties said and consider what the true relationship was. 
The tribunal found that Ms Dewhurst was highly integrated into the business and was expected to work if she said that she would. She was in constant contact with the controllers via the city tracker, radio and mobile phones, and any change to her working pattern had to be discussed with the controllers. Ms Dewhurst was therefore working on City Sprint's behalf and was economically and organisationally dependent upon the company. She was a worker from the moment she switched on her City Tracker to the moment she logged out. This decision currently applies to Ms Dewhurst only, but it's a huge warning again to businesses that operate similar models. The question of worker status is likely to be a common theme in the tribunals this year, as it's been reported that other alleged self-employed individuals are pursuing companies such as Addison Lee, eCourier and Excel for employee or worker status. So, watch this space. And finally, staying on the subject of being self-employed, I've no doubt that many of us are scrambling around at the moment to fill in our self-assessment tax returns and checking down the back of the sofa to find enough to pay our tax bills. On that note, I read a great story this week about an angry American chap who decided to pay a tax liability in quite an extraordinary way. Apparently, this story began when Nick Stafford from Virginia tried in vain to get information about his tax liability for sales tax on two new cars from the Department of Motor Vehicles. After a number of refusals to provide telephone numbers for the DMV, Mr Stafford filed three lawsuits against them. When the lawsuits were dismissed, Mr Stafford decided to make things inconvenient for the DMV by paying the $3,000 tax bill by delivering 300,000 coins to the local DMV office in five wheelbarrows. It was reported that it took DMV staff seven hours to count the coins. However, it apparently cost Mr Stafford $1,000 to buy the wheelbarrows and hire people to break open the hundreds of rolls of coins. I'm not quite sure who had the last laugh here, but I certainly found it very funny. Until next time. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed our episode. If you want to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more updates, click here. If you want to follow us on our Twitter page, which gives you a daily heads up about everything employment law related, click here. Or if you just want any more information or help, please go to our website by clicking here. And of course, all of the links are below. Once again, thanks for watching and see you next time.